First of all, let me take the time and thank the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault for entrusting me with an assignment such as this, where my only intention is to enlighten, empower, and encourage all who are participating in their very first virtual TASA conference, which, if I may add, is most appropriately themed for times such as these, Lift Every Voice. This theme really speaks importance to all victims of lifting our voices after sexual trauma, but most importantly, TASA's 2020 theme, which also calls our attention to black voices, resounding in our victories as sexual assault survivors within a nation that has attempted to silence us for far too long. Now, before I go any further, let me take a moment to reflect on how the U.S. justice system failed me as a sexual assault victim and how I also found my own voice. When I began healing my, my healing processes, I was invoked, I invoked my Christian faith in my God who then led me to reach into the creative gifts that he has blessed me with. And that was poetry. I want you to experience the transition as much as possible. And if you will permit me to pause right here for about three minutes, I would love to share with you one of my healing poetic pieces entitled Rape. It was in February of 2010, I actually debuted this uh, poem along with many other pieces in Dallas, Texas. And just a year later, I was honored with the opportunity to give me the healing poetry in an inter international platform as I was blessed to tour Johannesburg, Port Elizabeth, Pretoria, and Cape Town, South Africa as part of the 2011 DNA for South Africa initiative. Before the video recording is played, I would also like to disclose that viewing it may trigger some deep-rooted emotions that you have suppressed from your own trauma or inadvertently tried to deny because you felt the world has denied your healing processes for far too long. However, if you attentively listen to my words, my prayer is that you agree and accept the fact that rape is something that we all need to talk about a topic that we can no longer just pray about, as it is a heinous act of violence as witnessing the public execution of Mr. George Floyd. Only when we command justice for all victims of hatred, rage, bigotry, etc., will our personal experiences of sexual violence contribute to the complete overall of the injustice responsible for the systemic murders of our black lives that Black Lives Matter connects with, with and include our own cause, great as survivors of sexual assault. Our collective demand for social justice, equality in advocacy services, positive prevention and survivor-centered processes, all of which are evidence that we lift every voice. Rape is a four-letter word that after so long, many are led to believe that it is a bad word. A word left unspoken by all, but an act that you never forget as a victim. The dictionary says that devastation is to cause severe or widespread damage to something or to shock or upset somebody greatly. And unfortunately, this is only a glimpse of the true meaning of what rape has done to me. I ask you, how can a small four-letter word, one syllable word, have such an intricate and lasting effect on a child with big dreams and aspirations? Violent outbursts and crying for no reason, fear of the unknown, and panic attacks when a stranger approach you unexpectedly. Contemplation of suicide and trusting no man, not your spouse or the man called your father. Asking God over and over again, why did he allow this to happen to you? And why did he leave you here to relive that day over and over again for the rest of your life? Thinking that if I give myself to a man willingly, that I am now in control and he won't take it forcibly. So emotional and so detached at times that you're not even convinced that you can even lead a normal life again. Then you are so angry and bitter with your parents that you almost despise them because they were not there to protect you from this heinous thing. Some want to ease the pain so bad that they turn to drugs, alcohol, prostitution, homosexuality, and crime. Then we dare not forget about those that want revenge or carry out personal vendettas and find themselves praying and violating others, sometimes even their loved ones. Understanding there is no excuse for this heinous crime 
and I am not giving any. But I do want you to realize that this cause has many great and destructive effects, not only in the victim lives, but for those that surround them. For almost 20 years, I wrapped my mind around this thing and tried for so long to make some sense out of something that don't make sense. I wanted so hard to try and understand what I was going through and why, but I found no answers, but only more questions, more dead ends, more frustrations that led to deeper anger. However, through it all, I was able to hold on to the one thing that was invisible to all, yet with it, nothing is impossible, and by it, I was able to reach the intangible, finally realizing that the sky is the limit, and I, like the phoenix, have resurrected from the ashes of a life cycle that had to come to an end. Although I am not mythical, I have regenerated from being hurt and wounded by a foe, and now I soar into my destiny of helping others heal and walk into theirs. Now, if you will bow with me for a moment of silence, I would like to do a prayer. Father God, I come to you bowed and humble as I know how. Father God, first to say thank you. Lord God, I thank you for another day that was not promised to me. Father God, I ask that you take me out of self so that someone who is hurting, feel that all hope is lost, feel that there is nothing else to live for, will find their way today and have a breakthrough from their traumas of sexual assault and all the other bitterness that it brings. Lord God, I continue to pray for our country. I pray for our first responders. I pray for our police officers. I pray for our sane nurses who stand on the front lines and who stand with the victims of sexual violence. I pray for our justice system. Lord God, I continue to pray for the issues we're going through with COVID-19. Lord God, I pray that you move depression out of the way, that you would just embrace your love and that everybody see your loving kindness that you have for them. Lord God, I pray that this conference would be used for the purpose that you have it served today. These are the many blessings I ask in your precious name. Amen. Thanks to each of you for allowing my healing poetry to have an audience this afternoon. Now I would like to share with you another healing exercise. Not only have I written poetry as an expression and an experience of empowerment, I've also written narratives for the same purpose. I would like to read you a letter that I wrote to a survivor of a gang rape. This victim was a 24-year-old wife and a mother as well as a sharecropper's daughter in 1944, Alabama. Her name was Reese Taylor. You were born in a time that was not safe for black girls, Reese. It was a time of oppression and degradation for black girls to be born, to be beautiful, to be carefree, and to be innocent. But the gravest danger of it all was to be born a black girl that dares to have a voice. Dear Reese, that dreadful night in September of 44 was a night that I can imagine you believed you would have, been, would have been memorable as you walked home with friends from a church revival. And in my mind, I know you felt a fresh rain pouring your spirit from the joy of revival and maybe even were able to do a release for after the trauma of your mother's death from when you were just a teenage girl. Dear Reese, during that walk, you felt safe because you understood that the joy of the Lord was your strength. During that walk, you felt loved as you were among dear friends that knew they were in good company as they walked along beside you. I'm sure exchanging enduring conversations as you thought of your loving husband and baby girl at home waiting for you to grace them with your presence. That was a walk, dear Reese, that I can also imagine you felt secure because even though the sun was going down, you took solace in knowing that no harm had ever come by your way just from walking home especially as you journey in the confidence of knowing that you still had a strong and protective father that would run to your rescue whenever you called upon his name. In your 24 years, I can only imagine what you could have seen or experienced as a sharecropper, living on land that I'm sure you had to put in your contribution of hard labor only to share a portion of the proceeds that you were coerced to be delivered to the landowner. Dear Reese, in those 24 years of sharecropping, it had to be even more difficult to endure because you were indeed born a little black girl. What sort of images and impressions came to your mind as I read you the letter I wrote to Reese? What would you feel 
if you knew that her six white male attackers escaped justice? What would you think if you knew that she was offered $600 or $100 per perpetrator as a crime victim compensation? What would you do if you realized that here in 2020, there are still denials of justice and equality, demeaning crime victim responses? Do you need more facts and data to find answers to these questions? Well, I don't mind you putting me under the bus if that helps. Using a third person sketch, I would like to stay in this creative healing flow and share with you the awful continuities between being black while raped in 1944 and being black while raped in the 20th century. You should recognize the victim. Her name is Lavinia. Lavinia, you were born obviously in a time that was still not safe for black girls. Obviously, it was still a time of oppression and degradation for black girls to be born, to be beautiful, to be carefree, and to be innocent. But the gravest danger of it all was to be born a black girl that dares to have a voice. Dear Lavinia, that dreadful night in July of 1985 was a night that I imagine would have been memorable as you laughed and played downstairs in the privacy of your home with your siblings and cousins after a fun-filled day of summer activities. In my mind, I know you felt greater days were ahead because you were preparing to start your freshman year in high school in the fall at Law Magnet, a school that you long awaited acceptance from when you were just an elementary girl. Dear Lavinia, during that night, you felt safe because you knew your mama and stepdad were sleeping upstairs as you were surrounded by your younger loved ones downstairs. During that night, you felt joyful and at peace. You had a mama that was very protective and would never allow any harm to her children. That was a sleepover, dear Lavinia, that I also imagine you felt secure because even though the sun was going down, you took solace in knowing that no harm had ever come your way from sleeping in the privacy of your own home, especially since you were raised in a faith that gave you the confidence of knowing that you always had an omnipotent, omniscient, omniscient and om omnipresent protective heavenly father that not only ha has always watched over you, but would come to your rescue. Whenever you called on his name, Lavinia, his name, and in your 13 years, I can only imagine what could have been seen or experienced as a child that witnessed her mother escape death from domestic violence while she battled the demons from multiple heinous rapes, living with various family members, flooded with innumerable amounts of insecurities and debts of instability. Dear Lavinia, at 13 years old, rape had to be even more difficult to endure because you were indeed also born a little black girl. I've shared three creative expressions with you about rape thus far. A video recording of my poem entitled Rape, a letter I wrote to Reese Taylor, and a character sketch that I wrote about myself. I ask you, I ask that you would either write a piece of paper, text to yourself, or use the chat feature to document a few notes, thoughts, and reactions to how I would have used creative expression to present rape thus far. I need you to record your thoughts and reactions in a tangible way because I'm about to shift another important factor embedded in Thompson's call to lift our voice. Not only do we have to empower, do we have to be empowered to talk about rape, we also must be empowered to talk about race as well. In making my way to talking the intersection of rape and race, I muse about how I came from, the, from this title for this address. When I began thinking about the keynote address, I came up with the title, all eyes on me, M period E. The M standing for my and the E for ethnicity. I really like the poetry of the title, but it made me laugh a little bit to myself, as I presume many of you re that registered for this conference might have thought that I was going to pay some sort of tribute to the late rapper Tupac Shakur. I must admit, even though I was a fan of Tupac, that unfortunately I'm not going to do a tribute to the Machiavelli at all. Rather, I am, however, using a play on words or an intentional pun. I do this because many of us are guilty of intentionally crossing the murky waters of one's race against the ethnicity when it comes to social justice, economic status, social privilege, and many other social 
and physical disparities. It seems we all we seems we all fail to find clarity when it comes to understanding that race is usually associated with biology and linked with physical characteristics such as skin color or hair texture. You know, like they say, some black people hair is kinky or textured versus uh, Caucasian people or white people hair is normally flat or straight. While on the other hand, ethnicity is linked with cultural expression and identification, such as cultural group in the U. Such as many cultural groups in the U.S. may recognize Thanksgiving as a national holiday and will take the time off to reflect on family and loved ones that they all have to be thankful for. However, still both are social constructs used to categorize and characterize seemingly distinct populations. And although many say that it's almost impossible to draw a line between race and ethnicity, I stand before you today to challenge you to see that blurred line that stands between my race and my ethnicity for what it is, a distraction. That same blurred line that allows you only to see my darker skin complexion, my more textured hair, wider hips, maybe higher cheekbones, and more voluptuous lips that causes you to have an unmerited hatred towards me. When eventually you would delay or deny me justice, disqualify me for economic promotions or gain, or even lynch me publicly without remorse. All because when you see a black person, you have already mentally determined that black lives have no merit. Therefore, we don't matter. All because many refuse to come out of those murky waters and see that black lives do matter if you focus not just on our race, but our ethnicities. My ethnic background consists of black, white, and American Indian. And I'm quite sure that once I complete my ancestry DNA test that I will identify with more ethnic groups because broadly speaking, ethnicity is our heritage and ancestral roots. My ethnicity, ethnicity should matter the most as it makes me who I am on the inside and not how I look to you on the outside. The funny thing about it is that many get so hung up on the color of one's skin that they fail to realize we probably all speak the same language, celebrate the same occasions, and share a common history with others within our very own groups. Rape. This is what happened to Reese Taylor on September the 3rd, 1944. She was walking home from a church revival one evening and was kidnapped and gang raped by six white men. Race. This is what prevented her from getting the justice she deserved. Even though the men confessed to the assaults and various eyewitnesses, the jury refused to indict them. The black community of Abbeville, where Racy lived, was outraged at the actions taken by the police. And the event was reported to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Montgomery, Alabama. Rape. This is what happened to me. Your keynote, Lavinia Masters. On that night of July 31st, 1985, I was sleeping downstairs and a man entered one of our downstairs windows and raped me at knife point. And I was just 13 years old. Race. Now that I have lived in a world so full of disdain towards the colors of one's skin and have witnessed with my own eyes the brutality that can be inflicted upon you solely based on your skin color, I stand before you with a clear conscience and now say that yes, I was denied justice because of the color of my skin. You see, just like Reese Taylor, I too refused to remain silent and immediately reported my crime against me. Unfortunately, just as Reese Taylor, I was instantly denied justice. Denial, a word that cuts deep like a knife and is, and is slower and more difficult to heal as the wound is deeper when it is saturated with rape and racial discrimination. The thing that really disturbs me now is that is that I did not understand back in 1985 that when the responding officers came out to investigate my rape, that they, were all, they already had a preconceived notion of how to handle me. I make these bold statements because the officers ask me these questions like, am I sure he's not my boyfriend? Did I let him in? Am I making the story up so my mama won't know that I was having sex? I mean, they insulted not only my integrity and my intelligence as a 13 year old, but now they're actually, uh, looking back over that night, they insulted my race. They actually made me feel as though I should not have bothered them with these type of calls. Almost as if they were wanting me to believe or maybe convince me that this is what was supposed to happen to little black girls. 
because now as I take my mind back, I never heard of Reese Taylor's or saw breaking news of officers searching high and low for the rapists that violated many of my black sisters. However, I do recall the 1989 Central Park jogger rape of the Caucasian woman, Trisha Maley, during making major news. And as they were so desperate to bring her justice for the crimes against her, they immediately arrested and incarcerated five black boys to secure and bring her, her swift justice while denying those five black boys theirs and they were eventually proven innocent. My point, due to the poisonous, toxic mixture of rape, racism, and denial, it has been discovered that black women are the most forgotten survivors of sexual assault. And I agree with the statement of one Reese Taylor was forgotten until the NAACP sent her best investigator, Rosa Parks, to Reese's father's hometown to explore what happened there. Her efforts result, resulted in the formation of the Committee for Equal Justice, which later became known as the Montgomery Improvement Association. However, even with the backing of the NAACP, the creation of the Committee for Equal Justice for Ms. Reese Taylor, confessions, eyewitnesses, our dear Reese was still denied justice during both trials. It would have, it would have taken the state of Alabama 66 years after the publication of Daniel L. McGuire's book At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape and Resistance, a new history of the civil rights movement from Rosa Parks to the rise of black power in 2011 to lead to formal apologies from the Alabama legislator to Taylor on behalf of the state for its failure to prosecute the attackers. Well, the joint resolution was adopted by the Alabama, Alabama legislator in April 21, 2011. Then there was my case, a rape that was reported immediately, but would take nearly 21 years to solve through DNA as it was suspended on August 2nd, 1985. As my evidence along with my justice would be placed quietly upon a shelf, it wasn't even a full three days later. Yes, I was convinced that the America where I was born and lived in not only expected black girls or women to be raped, but that our attacks were often forgotten as survivors of sexual assault. And I got proof of being forgotten as it was made aware that my evidence indeed sat on that shelf for over 20 years with thousands of other rape kits. That, take it as my break. Oh, but just as I did, Reese, in 2003, I refused to remain silent and I refused to retract my story. This was just the beginning of my quest to enlighten victims with hopes of bringing justice to every rape survivor whose evidence sat on shelves all over the nation. And the fuel I needed to empower my little black girls to continuously lift their voices after sexual trauma. So here I stand today, and just like my dear Reese, as the injustices of my case were widespread over the nation of how I was denied not one but two statute of limitations, the Texas House of Representatives sent out one of the best to investigate these injustices against rape victims in Texas, and that was the Representative Victoria Niave. It was due to, rep to Representative Niave's hard work and dedication that she was able to initiate an omnibus bipartisan bill, House Bill 8, that would also bear my namesake, the Lavinia Masters Act an act that will positively impact all victims of rape in the state of Texas and that would an act that would be named a law effective September the 1st 2019 this is how my denial was overturned to delay this is where my justice became a form of justice for all this is when I knew I was completely free from the bondage of rape and now addicted to freedom and this is where I knew I was initiating every survivor of rape to lift every voice. According to the National Center of Violence Against Women in the Black Community, for every black woman who reports rape, at least 15 black women do not report. One in four black girls will be sexually abused before the age of 18. One in five black women are survivors of rape. 35% of black women experience some sort of contact sexual, sexual violence during their lifetime. 40 to 60% of black women report being subjected to coercive sexual contact by age 18. 
percent of black women experience sexual violence other than rape by an intimate partner during their lifetime. And even though social movement widely described as a civil rights movement emerged out of black women demanding control over their bodies and their lives, black men being killed for protecting black women or ultimately the fight for black women's bodies and agency and against white supremacist rape and assault, here we are over eight decades later where black women still need protection from sexual violence despite the civil rights movement. So I ask you, where do we go from here? I thought we already overcame. Why does history keep repeating itself? I remember growing up when I was inspired by three of the most beautiful people in the world. They also happened to be black. They were poet Laura Langston Hughes, Dr. Maya Angelou, and Chief Justice Thurgood Marshall. I realized that these leaders inspired me because when I read what they wrote and what they lacked, I could feel the connection. I felt empowered because I felt as if their lives related to my experiences. And I felt loved by them despite the pain and suffering in their lives, connecting my trauma with their, pen with their perseverance through rape, homophobia and bigotry, and racial discrimination. My purpose in me finding inspiration to heal from my own experience of sexual trauma was discovery of my identity that led me to my life's purpose. My advice on how to find who or what will inspire you, look for your life's interruptions. Steal your mind long enough so that you can search the deepest part of yourself. The meaning that tells you this is the reason I am alive. But ironically, that sort of clarity and purpose can initially be perceived as a distraction. And if anyone would have told me that I've been violently raped at 13 years old, that would be the root of an entire movement, I probably would have slapped him. Who wants to be raped? But please know your inspiration can come from your victimization. It happens when you decide to lift your voice and be that light, a light that leads you first and foremost out of the wilderness of your own victimization and isolation. That trauma disrupted and interrupted us but you can take back your life, your light, and your voice. The sexual assault didn't take away from you. Violating your body didn't rob or deprive us of our power. As a matter of fact, I believe that it gave us the power to empower others. With this power, we can protect ourselves by prevention, education, public policy, and awareness. With this power, we become overcomers, and by compassion guide others, guide others down the same path of healing. With this power, we can change history to accept that black lives do matter, especially for the cause of raping with the intent of destroying our black girls. So in conclusion, once you completed this 2020 Lift Every Voice TASA conference, I want to present you with two challenges. First and most importantly, if you personally have experienced sexual assault, please know that you are actually only a victim of circumstance. You are not a failure. You are not a defect. You are not a reject. You are not worthless. Yet, when you allow yourself to internalize the sexual assault as your fault, then you are making a choice to victimize your own self over and over again. You are practicing psychological, emotional, and mental self-harm. You are deciding that self-destruction is your destiny and fate because you were a victim of sexual trauma. So my prayer and the challenge is that all sexual assault victims will begin to lift their voices by pouring your energies into the things that bring you joy, which comes down to finding your way back to the magic, the uniqueness, and the passion that lets you know that you are not the sum total of being a victim of sexual assault. Find your way back to you. Then my second challenge is for those that may have not experienced sexual assault. I need you guys to question your level of compassion. With this instant access and digital age of information, data, etc., we run the risk of becoming desensitized to sexual assault. And are you doing or saying all you can to ensure that sexual assault victims are, are in a safe space? Do you contribute prayers, money, or time to people or organizations dedicated to helping sexual assault survivors lift their voices? What exactly are you doing to be a listening heart in the event you can't donate time or money? Are you willing to be their lungs when they can no longer breathe? Are you willing to be a conduit of unconditional love 
and a natural nurturer when they cry out for a mother's embrace in their time of crisis? Are you willing to take their hands and lead them in the right direction when they have seemed to have lost their way? When their voices are just faint in a whisper, are you willing to help them lift their voices loud as resounding cymbals? I ask you, what are your eyes watching? Hopefully all eyes are watching me, M period E, my ethnicity, and not the color of my skin, even though I still say that my black people, we are beautiful. Thank you. Today I'm having a party. Today I'm going to dance. Today I'm singing a new song. No matter the circumstance. Healing is awesome, y'all. Can't wait to invite all my friends. You gonna come check it out? Sharing the good news with all I encounter. Maybe I'll post an ad in the classified. Baby, she telling everybody a, a public announcement. You see, I have a reason to celebrate. She said God healed her, and I have a reason to rejoice. Hey, she's not the same. God has delivered me from sexual trauma. She told her testimony to everybody. Give me back my voice. So now, with a new lease on life, I rejoice as I sing my song. Life has taken on a new meaning. Girl, let's check out her party. With my head up high, my confidence is strong. She said it's a major celebration. As I celebrate the release of my sexual trauma, she's no longer his. I celebrate the release of all pain. She's releasing all back to God. Convinced that I am more than a conqueror through Christ. I really thought in Jesus' name. I no longer live in disappointment. The shame no longer belongs to me. My cup runneth over in contentment. I hold my head up in dignity. I'm resting atop the peaceful hill. With the valley of serenity below. I've learned through faith where all my help lies. And sleep where the living grow. The shackles of the feet have been loosed. Do you ever dream what's beyond the clouds? Is there more to it than what we see? Searching for the truth and what we read I need to believe Sometimes the pressure is so much I can take Constantly I'm hearing God's on His way Anxiously I'm waiting for